Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session with Dr. Paco Calvo, Learning to See Green in an Ecological Crisis. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Sarah Abbott, and I'll be moderating the session along with Joella Jacobs. Hi. Yes. If you have questions for Paco during or at the end of his 30-minute presentation, feel free to write them in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And you can also put comments in the chat if you like. And as a reminder, this session is being recorded and the chat will be used for future reference. So Paco, thank you so much. Over to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's see. I can share a screen. Okay, can you see my full screen? Yes. Good. Okay, so well, let's see. Well, thanks. First of all, it's a it's a pleasure to be oh, here. Paco, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to interrupt you because I just had a nice reminder from Joella in my anxiousness to get started that I didn't read your bio. So I'm going to properly you, introduce you. You doing what? I didn't read your bio, so I'm going to properly, <laughs> properly introduce you. So Paco Calvo is a professor of philosophy of science at the Universidad de Murcia, Spain, as well as the principal investigator or head honcho, as he puts it, of the Minimal Intelligence Lab or the Mint Lab, also at the Universidad de Murcia. Paco is concerned with issues at the intersection of plant biology and cognitive science and wants to know what, if anything, is there, is to, say, is there to say about the intelligence of plants? Sorry about that, Paco. Over That's to okay. you, officially. Over <laughs> to you. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. So the head honcho line I owe it to Adrian, a predoc in my lab. He's, he's the webmaster and he, he jot downs those funny <laughs> lines. So <laughs> the, re, the, the acknowledgements go to him. And actually, I should also acknowledge um, the title, the very title of the talk, Learning to See Green in an Ecological Crisis, to my colleague, uh, Natalie Lawrence. This is a, actually, this is like um, what I'm going to be talking about today. It's pretty much uh, the main thesis of a book chapter we, we co-wrote with the same title, Learning to See Green in an Ecological Crisis for a, for a book on the ecological emergency. Um, um, and I think um, the main line, uh, both of in that, in that work I'm, I'm here today for this short, 30 minutes talk. My main worry has to do with the tension in between the, the urgency, this emergency. I mean, if, if this is a real emergency, we have to do something now, right? So real quick, right? Oh, I lost you, Sarah. I cannot see you anymore. Can you switch your quick? Ah, there you go. <laughs> Stay young. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't have eye contact. <laughs> and yeah, and, and one, now, what I was saying is that uh, if this is a real, a real emergency, we really need to be doing something real quick. And that is a problem because what we have to do requires plenty of time. So that's the tension I want to bring to your attention. It's, it's a pity. I mean, this is the good and the bad news. The good news is that I think we have an idea in the very, in the very actual, in the very title of the, of, of the conference toward the new way of being with plants. In Sarah's introduction, we could see what that uh, new idea or the, the direction we should be taking uh, amounts to. Um, Sarah mentioned we don't need to be, or we shouldn't be considering or thinking of plants as resources, as objects. They are agents in themselves. We can truly talk about plant sentience. We should be understanding what we truly mean about plant intelligence as something to be done non-metaphorically, but to truly understand what it means for a plant to to cognize, to have, a, to have mentality, to have subjectivity, to be truly agents in their own world with their interests, etc. Cetera, et cetera, right? So, so um, we really need to understand that, and that's the way to go. But so another way to put it is that we should try to, to, to recover from this uh, um, plant blindness we all suffer from. And the bad news is that this 
this means education and education takes time, right? That's something I go in, in way in much more detail in, in Planta Sapiens. By the way, Sarah, this is the book I started five years ago when we met in Edinburgh. Now it's a new title, it's Planta Sapiens, it's at last coming out in 2022. But the original title when we met in Edinburgh, if you remember, was, was Plant Cognition, the Next Revolution. So still that's pretty much the idea, what sort of revolution we need to be engaging in in order to, to meet these, these, these uh, high demands, right? Uh, to bridge this gap in between the fastness and the slowness of the educational um, um, process required. So this is, um, to do that, uh, our modest, uh, um, our little grain we can contribute to, uh, we, we try to understand plans uh, by looking, well, first of all, we need to understand that we need to take it easy, to chill out, to relax, to step back, and to look at them at their own pace. And it requires a lot of patience and to train our eye, right? So to do that, we do time lapse. Um, we record them with, with time lapse technology, just like assembling uh, time lapse footage and trying to understand overt plan behavior to, to see what is it that they are doing and to try to make the sense of what is it that they are doing. And on the other hand, we try to combine those, um, those footages that we can study with uh, um, electrophysiological recordings. So we can record the electrical activity of the plant within the plant, right? Pretty much as you could do with a human or an animal subject, right? You could put some electrodes. That's what you have, what you can see here. Those are the electrodes. So we can put them, we called it a phytoacupuncture because these are acupuncture needles. So we made these electrodes with acupuncture needles and we insert them through the main stem and we can record the electrical activity of the plant as it's uh, performing some activity. Um, so we know from these studies, looking at the behavior itself and looking at the physical recordings, we know that plants are able to, 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 to anticipate, to predict the future. They are able to, to of course, to, to behave um, flexibly, uh, anticipatorily in a goal-directed manner. So they can, they can, they have their own objectives, their own targets, and they have their own way to, to reach those targets. So, so it's just a matter of, 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 of changing the way we look at plants, to learning to see green. That's what we mean by that, right? Um, so this is, what, this is what the setting would look like if you, if you look at this. So that would be like the, this sort of cavings we are using. We put the plants in here, right? So the plants go into these booths um, and we can set the electrodes and study them in this way. This would be like the, what the whole setting would look like. Um, that's just a sketch, actually. Vicente Raja is the first author of this paper we published last year. He will be talking about this uh, in a few, in a couple of hours' time, I think. So I will leave that aside for him to explain. But this is what the, the setting would look like, more or less, right? So we can look at the plant from the top or from the lateral view. Now, if you do that, this is what it looks like. Oh. <laughs> so I want you to watch this video, but. I think it's gonna give us trouble. Yeah. Yes, hold on a sec. Let me see if we can watch it here. Okay, am I still, can you see the video now? Okay, good, good. So if you watch, just, just pay attention to the lateral view, right? Sorry, to the top view. So you can see here like a climbing beam is growing while circumnutating around, revolving around, trying to reach for the pole. So just, just look as it's trying to reach for it. Just look, it's almost getting there. Oh, did you see that? Mm. Did you see that? Let me just show you that bit again. You see that? Again, oh, almost, almost, right? Okay. Then at the same time, I want you to pay attention to this lateral view. You see the leaves, um, the main leaves of the climbing being, uh, they were actually, um, look at them, they are horizontal. Now you'll see it starts to drop them, right? They drop, they drop in anticipation of the lights going off, right? So the plant is going to bed, it's going to sleep. Right, now you see the lights went off, now this is dark. And you can see that the plant is actually anticipating the day-night cycle. So on both views, we have something interesting, which is like, you can see the, I would say the effort the plant is, is making, trying to reach for the pole, right? If you could see that. 
And at the same time, uh, you can see um, how the plant was anticipating that day-night cycle, it's synchronizing to the, to, the, to the cycles, right? That are meaningful to the plant. Um, but uh, just watch this. This is a, a video from a psychology experiment uh, back in the 40s. You'll see how old the video is, it's back from the 1940s. Just watch, watch the video for a moment. Right, I think, I think you got the idea more or less. Um, do you realize, uh, I was gonna say Sarah, Sarah, Joel and everybody else. Do you realize how difficult it is to look at those triangles and geometric figures without, you know, positing or projecting our intentions onto them. They are trying to, one is fetching the other, the other is it's trying to hide, is intending to. So, so it's so difficult not to project all these psychological predicates, all this psychological vocabulary onto the, the cartoon we were observing. So something similar is happening in the case of the climbing being, I would like to say. And that's what I think is really risky um, because we might be mm, putting too much cart before horse in trying to help ourselves when we are trying to understand plants. So that's to me, to me what I would like to discuss is the risk of in, in, in trying to understand plants, in trying to learn to see green, my worry here is not the skeptical attitude of those that don't believe in plant intelligence or plant sentience, but our own approach that we might be overinterpreting or misinterpreting what we mean by plant intelligence, by plant sentience. So we need to truly understand what is it that the plant is doing in itself, by itself, for itself. That's why when we were watching the climbing being trying to reach for the pole, I was like, oh, almost, all that almost is what we should prevent from doing, right? So that's to me, that's the thread that we really need to train our eye to do it without over-interpreting the data. Um, another way to put it is, uh, oh, it's not, there you go. Yeah, so basically what I'm trying to say is that uh, we should, we need, really need to make an effort to put ourselves in their shoes to truly understand what is it that matters to them? What is it that they care about themselves for themselves and not through our eyes, right? And that's to me the most difficult part of it because otherwise we are still, even though we believe we are not, we are still stuck to this understanding of plants as resources. Maybe it's a different sort of resource. It's not resources as the skeptics would like to think, but we might still be using them as resources, even though we think we are not doing it, right? So we, that's, the, that's been the, the, the effort we need to make to understand what is it that matters to them themselves for themselves, not through our eyes. Um, if you think about it, about all the stuff that they care about, well, and, and, I mean, the list, the list is huge, right? So this is just a handful of, 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 of parameters and, and we could go through it for hours, I mean, but, to put it differently is just we need to we need to understand that they need to be responding to all these parameters to all these sources of stimulation all these things that they care about and to understand how they integrate all this information to provide a response that is globally adaptive they need to be doing something with all these things impinging on the sensory surface and understand what is it that they are doing in response to that not just in response to that but proactively so anticipatory what is it that they do to anticipate to dangers, to threats, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's the most difficult part. But if you put it 
somewhat differently is not that difficult. I mean, if we take seriously the analogy with, with the way we, not that they are animal-like, but that our methodology, the, the very same way we study animals can be used for the purpose of studying plants, even though if the result is different. So if you just think physiologically, the very same uh, subsystems that we understand physiologically in animals, human or non-human animals, is the very same thing we can do when we study plants. So we can simply look at the physiology, at plant physiology, simply understanding those same functions. If you think of the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the skeletal system, you will find all those functional analogues in the case of plants. You just need to think that this simply more broadly distributed. Right? So they employ this divide and, co and, and conquer strategy simply because they are rooted, they can't flee. So they achieve their own ends through different means. But in essence, the very same approach can be applied. So we can understand them through physiology. Now, this is what most uh, physiologists, plant physiologists miss in this case. And is that when we do that, this is the little uh, change of emphasis we need to implement. We need to understand the vascular system of a plant, if you look at the phloem and xylem pathways, not just as the pathways that they use to translocate sugars and water and minerals and substances throughout the plant body, but to truly understand that vascular system as an information processing system. Now we are thinking of plants as subjects. That's what it means to think of them as agents, as subjects, as agents that process information from their, for their own purposes. Right? So all those parameters that we saw before, they are incorporating all that information, integrating it, processing all that information, and providing a response that is globally adaptive. That's what we mean by that. So it's not simply doing plant physiology. It's on top of the plant physiology, is understanding plants from a psychological perspective, as systems, as subjects, as agents that process information for their own purposes. Right? That's the approach, the information processing approach that we need to apply to plants. And that's something we can do by bringing in the methodologies from the psychology, from psychology, from the cognitive sciences, and not just from the plant physi physiology, right? Now, remember I mentioned um, that we could insert electrodes? Well, that's something we can do. And on top of that, uh, we can actually check out what spikes, what, what fires, because plant cells fire like neurons. So when we say plants are information processing agents, we truly mean it. It's simply that they exploit a different, a different vehicle to convey or to pass along those messages. So the same electrochemical messages can be passed along the plant body. They simply use non-neural cells, but they still fire. So the, the action potential, if you think of an animal neuron, the firing of an action potential takes place in the plant. This is an action potential, right? So this action potential that you can see here is the one we are recording when we are stimulating the inner hair of a Venus flytrap. Now, the thing is that we can do more things on top of that. Um, actually, I like to think of plants as, as, in a sense, as locked in syndrome patients, because it's like uh, when we are trying to open up this, this um, channel of communication in between us and plants, um, there is something we are missing, and we are missing, of course, uh, 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 um, uh, the communication channel itself. So it looks like as if, as if they were fully alive Mentally speaking, they are there and they can't flag they are alive. That's why it takes so much effort on, on our behalf to try to understand it. Because we really need to train ourselves to understand or how to interpret the type of messages that are there, that are understood, for example, by insects, by pollinators, by other animals that they have co-evolved with. And we are still missing those messages. So that's what we need to learn, how to interpret those messages. right? And in a sense, I can't help but to think of them as, as locked-in syndrome patients. Uh, in fact, we can even put them to sleep with the, same, with the very same anesthetics that we use in animals. So isoflurane, that's something we've done. We've taken the Venus fry trap to the veterinary hospital and used isoflurane to put it to sleep. So the very same molecule that puts a, to sleep a cat, a dog, or a cow in a veterinary hospital, the active principle is the very same one we use to put to sleep a plant. Now, if you think about it seriously, what's happening here? Well, of course, in a sense, nothing magical. It's simply that it's preventing action potentials from, from taking place because it's, it, it's messing up with, a, with a, a, a traffic of ions throughout the, throughout the membrane of the cells. So it's blo act effectively it's blocking the action potentials from firing. So action potentials can't fire. The, the plant cells don't fire, and then the Venus flytrap doesn't close. So if you see here, 
you can see uh, what happens when you stimulate the inner hair of the Venus flytrap. You can see how the trap closes as the closing of the trap after two stimulations. And this is what happens after the Venus fly, flytrap has been put to sleep with anesthetics. So you see now you stimulate the inner hair and it just doesn't close, right? Now, what happens after um, the anesthetics uh, effect goes? Now, it comes out of anesthesia. So what is it that is recovering? Now, we need to think of that third stage. What is it if you have put it to sleep, it has lost something? We are talking about the psychological phenomena from this coxi approach, cognitive science approach, and not just the physiological approach. What is it that what's happening when the plant comes out of anesthesia? What is it that it is regaining? That level of sentience is what we are after, right? So in a sense, we can use the very same type of resources uh, that we employ when we, uh, and when we uh, analyze uh, brain activity and, or try to track down the neural correlates of some cognitive function in animals. Think of the way you do that with human subjects. You put them to do some cognitive task and you can see what lights up in their brains. Now we can actually do that. We can, we can see what lights up in the vascular system of the plant. So what's firing when the plant is performing one task or another, right? So that's the way we can, we can sort of combine this level of observation that we do with the time-lapse photography and electrophysiological recordings. Now, this is interesting because as I mentioned, all this has to do with education, right? So we say, well, maybe we just need to train our eye. It takes time. But look what happens when you talk to people in, in plant physiology. Well, I, I guess you've seen, uh, most of you who will have seen this documentary, the, uh, the one produced by Michael Moore, Planet of the Humans. At some point, um, um, he says that, that, uh, that we should be using scientific knowledge rather than something else. And here is where I think we are missing the plot. It's not scientific knowledge rather than something else. It's what type of scientific knowledge we should be making use of that combined with that other something else provides at what we are still missing, right? So it's not that we should be seeing it as a conflation in between two worldviews and the scientists are providing this, you know, this view, the official orthodox view of what the way we should be understanding plants or the uh, environmental crisis. And then these other guys, people, these other people are doing something else, right? So that's what we need to, 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 to deny. But this is what happens. Uh, look, this is just a, a paper that just came out by Mike Blatt, the second author here. This is the editor-in-chief, the editor-in-chief of Plant Physiology. Plant Physiology, the, the journal, I would say. And the last author is Link Ties. Link Ties is the editor of the textbook Plant Physiology, which is the textbook that all undergrads go through in the whole world. So this is important. We are talking about education. Education means that any biologist, any plant biologist goes through these textbooks when they are trained as plant biologists or as plant physiologists, right? And look, this is the closing, this is the closing paragraph in this, in this article of theirs. What they are saying here, Basically, what they are saying here is that we, by we, I mean the, the research we do here at the Minimal Intelligence Lab, or the research František Paluska does in Bonn, in Germany, or Stefano Mancuso in Italy, all the research we do on, on, uh, on the quest of plant intelligence or plant sentience, plant cognition, plant consciousness, all these uh, lines of research we are, we are uh, uh, working into, they simply say, and read, this is, this is literal, that we shouldn't be getting funded. So funding agencies shouldn't be wasting their money in these projects. That journals shouldn't be publishing our work. So this is as serious as that. So, so the, when we say that we should try to understand plants through a different lens, that is not just a matter of plant physiology, that is a matter of plant psychology, of understanding plant sentience, of understanding their own interests, their own goals, what is it that they do when they are processing information to achieve those goals? All these things we are talking about, the response is to say, this guy shouldn't be funded, the research shouldn't get published in top journals, right? So that's why I say that, that this is gonna take longer than we think. If education means that we need to get all these undergrads to be exposed to these heterodox approaches, because there is not one and only one worldview 
that is going to provide the solution. And then, unless we understand that we have to combine all these worldviews into something that is more than the than the parts, right? Um, just take take this this example. Um, if I tell you about um, plant vision, um, we can use, well, this is, I mean, maybe most of you will know that you can take a picture with a plant leaf, right? So these are the chloroplasts. So the, the, the structures within the cells that, that, that allow the plant to do photosynthesis and, and, and chloroplasts move around, right? So if, 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 if it's all dark, they will uh, spread all over the cell. Um, if it's, if it's uh, you have some weak blue light, they will be like less scattered. And if it's really strong blue light, they will go to the periphery to prevent from taking so much light. So by in terms of the amount of chloroplast of the chloroplast concentration that you have on, on, on those cells in the leaves, and you can just place some figure on top of a leaf, and then you will see how out of the different intensity that is being, yes, thanks, that is being processed, you will see that, that you can actually take a picture with a leaf. So that's an actual picture you can take. Now, this is something interesting that you can play with, with uh, you know, primary school kids and things like this. You can have fun taking pictures with plant leaves, but there is something else behind this, this simply understood as a toy or as a game. Uh, and is that uh, these plant physiologists, this mainstream orthodoxy, will be misunderstanding what we mean to say. They might simply say, hey, of course, this is a metaphor. We don't mean to say that plants have eyes, that plants see. Well, maybe we do. Maybe we do if we do get rid of this animal-like understanding of what plant life is like. Remember what I said before about, about truly understanding what is it to understand plant life for themselves and not as resources. So uh, it's true that, that we don't mean to say that you see simply by showing that you can take a picture. Of course, I can take a picture with my Pentax camera and the Pentax camera doesn't see in the way we talk about vision in cognitive neuroscience, right? But uh, you can do that uh, if you if you think differently about the way plants um, about the way plants behave. In fact, if you even go to the plant physiology and morphology, you will find that the very same structures that we find the very same structures that we find in the in the animal eye are there in the case of the leaf. So if you take a cut, uh, cross cut of the leaf, you will see those structures. You will see that you have the cuticle, the cuticle on top of the leaf. It plays the role of a cornea. So it's a cornea-like structure. If you think of the epidermis, the epidermis providing this light gradient is a lens-like structure. And if you think of those chloroplasts in the chlorophyll, that those were the chloroplasts we saw before that they were concentrating more or less depending on the intensity and the type of light. Those chloroplasts are providing the retina-like uh, functionality that you would have in the case of a plant. Now, if people in, in plant physiology go crazy about the very thought of plant vision, it's because they are not understanding what we mean by it. We don't mean to say that the plant has an animal-like eye that you can put like an eyeball stuck onto the plant. We are not saying that. We are saying that we need to get rid of the obsession of comparing plants to animals, that we should try to understand plants for themselves, in themselves, without paying so much attention to the comparison. And only by doing so, for example, we get rid of the obsession that we have with neurons. If you don't have neurons, what is the problem? They don't need neurons. They don't need to go shopping. They don't need to, they do photosynthesis. They are rooted. People like to say that plants can't afford to be stupid because they are rooted. And But since we need to be moving up and down, we cannot afford to be stupid. Hold on a sec. Maybe why don't you put it the other way around? Why don't you say, hey, plants, how smart they've got to be if they've been passing down their genes despite being rooted, right? So if we get rid of those obsessions, we might understand what we mean by, for example, not just plant vision, but plant sentience. What is it? this unity of consciousness is providing the plant with. Remember we said all these parameters. Well, the plant will be unifying all those into a, into a global picture of the world, right? So if we, if we are able to, env to, to, to envisage that, that uh, picture without falling prey of, the, of being enslaved by the animal comparison, then that's, that's the entry route to, to truly think different. And that's what I think we should be doing.
it will take a lot of time, for, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Paco. Yeah, thanks a lot. This was really, really fascinating to listen to. And I see already a few questions in our Q&A section. Just a reminder, please post your question there, questions there. Um, so I'm just going to, since we have little time, start off with the first one, if that's all right with you, Paco. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, a question from Pete. Um, can we also move beyond really seeing individual plants to seeing vegetations and its processes, goals, et cetera, as a whole? Consider our new understandings of mycorrhizal slash ecosystem relationships, et cetera, which seem to show emergent self-organization at even higher scales um, to Gaia and beyond. Put another way, can we see green in this holistic way, adding an even more profound shift in our relationship? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we definitely need to do that. I mean, we need to be doing both at the same time. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, underestimate the importance of putting the emphasis on the individual. Uh, so that's those those two those two objectives are compatible. So certainly we need to look at the at the emergent understanding of, of this whole picture, and of course there is a lot of symbiotic relations and and, 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 and you know all the work by Susan Seymour. That's what uh, this question is asking about. Is really there? I mean that we should be looking at these collective patterns of intelligence. That there is no way you can make sense of that of that collective emergence without uh, paying attention to the system, the global system as such. But with that being said, it's funny. Uh, it's <laughs> They are closing the building. This is nighttime here. Um, and, but at the same time, it's important to emphasize uh, that we will be missing something about this, this capacity, this necessity to empathize, to put ourselves in the shoes if we don't think of this plant in particular. So if I'm looking at the plant next to Sarah, I don't mean that species, I mean that plant in particular, because that plant in particular is exposed to many different parameters that only that plant is exposed to, right? So think, uh, there is a very interesting way to put it there. Many people say, are animals intelligent? And then you would say, well, which, how do you mean are animals in there? Which one? You mean a, an earthworm, an eagle, a wolf, a fox, a dolphin? Which one are you talking about? So they would need to think, you know, to narrow down the target before they can respond. But if we ask, are plants intelligent? People don't ask the same. People don't say which plant. People simply think of plants as a big basket that they all fall into. Now, I think we should make an effort to think of plants in the very same way we think of animals. We should be able to say, hey, hold on a sec, which plant do you mean? Because different plants might have different intelligence. The same animals do. If we are not able to think that we need to think of different plant species and different individuals before we are able to tackle that question, it's because we are still not truly thinking of them as subjects, because subjects have their different subjectivity, each of them, right? It's still pretty much compatible with the emergent global perspective, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll read you the next um, from an anonymous attendee. I wonder how much combining physiology and psychology to reframe plants as information processing agents contributes to a different way of relating to plants. How does this approach work to break from the colonial roots and practices of those same disciplines? And then they're listing ecology, psychology, et cetera. Um, besides emphasizing that plants are life beings that have their own physiological processes. Yeah, good, thanks. Another great question. Yeah, well, here we have to do something else which is even more complicated because the same way we are questioning orthodox plant physiology, we also have to question orthodox psychology and orthodox cognitive science. So the, 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 the work is, is twofold. So it's not only that these guys in the plant physiology community, in mainstream plant physiology, are missing what's stake is that in psychology, we are missing it too. So now we didn't have to go to get into that. Maybe Vicente Raja uh, uh, has some time to get into that during his talk, because we are on the same page here. And the idea is that we are not looking at the way we, so we shouldn't be incorporating the orthodox understanding of, of mentality of the mind, of the human mind or the animal mind, as we think of it, you know, like following the computer metaphor, like the hardware software distinction. So don't think that we are trying to unearth to identify the, the, the plant equivalent to our neural software, something running in their vascular system. So we need to question what we mean by the mind from within psychology itself, then apply it to this new type of plant science that we are after, right? So, the, so it is, that's another reason why it's gonna take even longer. 
But yeah, I, I entirely agree that we need to, to, to call into question again that, that, that framework. Thank you. We have another great question from Oliana. Paco, you mentioned planned mentality. What is, what is it about? Could you make it more clear, please? In case of plant intelligence, um, it, it's okay as plants react to stimuli, create, choose, and predict. Um, and is it like body intelligence? I'm a little bit interpreting here, but, uh, but, but plant mentality, what, what do you mean yeah. by that? Yeah, well, that's the big question, but uh, put it this way. Um, we are opening a huge can of worms here, right? But I like to say that the type of, I mean, the fact that it's a huge can of worms and that there might be very, very difficult questions that we might never be able to answer, doesn't mean that we don't have the right to ask them, which is the same that we do with humans and animals. So if you think of animal consciousness and you say, hey, or even take, I mean, not just animals, think of bacteria. I mean, people don't, people are happy to talk about bacterial consciousness. You know why? Because they locomote, they move around. So bacteria doing chemotaxis, people are happy with them because they move around. It's just plants because they are rooted that we are more skeptical about them. So, but if something moves around, we are, we are happy to project our, our, our psychological concepts onto them. Say, hey, they are doing this. They are making decisions. They are choosing, they are anticipating, they are doing all those things. So all I'm saying here, or the, what we try to do at the, in our lab is to uh, uh, not, not fall prey or try to look at plants, at plant mentality from one particular theory of consciousness. So there are many theories of consciousness in the market. Of course, you cannot, you've got to get rid of those that are so anthropocentric that would only apply to linguistic animals. So just to us. But of course, that's, I mean, that's the good be stupid. But if, you're, if, you, if you go to the market and check which theories of consciousness are there, then all you need to do is to apply the same principles and rules to a different um, a branch in the tree of life. Because if they don't depend on the possession of a neural structure, if it's about the processing of information as such, and not the fact that that information processing is, is taking place courtesy of neuronal tissue. So you see, if it's not about the substrate implementation, but about what is it that is doing, then nothing prevents us from applying the framework to plant sentience. Now, I'm not trying not to respond because I haven't told you what's, what I mean by plant mentality, because I don't mean anything about plant mentality as you might say from without a theoretical framework. So take any framework in psychology that you wish. And if it's not tailor-made for humans, then you can apply it to plants, right? So there are many, many different theories that we can have. actually, we have exploited them all. So we have explored many different psychological frameworks and seeing how they might apply to plants. You can go for, you know, predictive processing theories that, that actually is just like, we are putting the emphasis on, on, on how they proactively, how they behave proactively. Now, if plants are not responding on a one-to-one -one basis to sources of stimulation, it's not that the plant is, oh, responding phototropically to a source of light, and the corner, oh, the plant is, is turning right because the blue light is there, or is responding to this uh, chemical over here. If, if we don't understand plants as responding like on this one-to-one -one basis, rather plants as integrating all the information such that they have to understand what's going on globally and provide a global response, then that's, what we, that's why we think sentience is required because it what it takes also for animals to behave adaptively and flexibly, to be able to deal in a unified way with respect to all these sources of stimulation, right? So apply any framework whatsoever to plants without human-based preconceptions, I would say, and, and be open-minded to explore them all. So if I provide you a tailor-made definition, I would be doing something wrong because we don't want to do that. We want to explore all of them in parallel. Thank you. Um, there's another question uh, in the chat. Um, Grace is asking, what attributes can be determined about a plant based on observing its daily fluxes in bioelectrical levels or action potential changes through e ECG? Its daily rhythms, what else? Its health? Yeah, well, you can do many things, actually. I mean, you can, uh, you can check, you know, uh, rates of photosynthesis, stomata closing and opening so not the stomata you know the, the, the tiny pores on the on the under leaves so the, how they are opening and closing regulating respiration regulating evaporations so many many things at many different levels 
um, um, electrical activity is not just the action potentials. The plants regulate many metabolic and physiological uh, responses throughout electrochemical uh, pathways throughout the whole vascular system and not just uh, um, action potentials they rely on, on what they are called slow wave potentials they are they they also employ uh, system potentials that work operate on different time scales so you can you can uh, track them down and interpret what they are after what they are for at many different time scales for many different uh, physiological and metabolical needs that go from from second to minute basis to to even uh, day or, or 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 longer longer time scales um, 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 again basically if we if we get rid of this this uh, obsession with animal neurons is is just what matters is the currency so we, we the nature found the currency which is electrochemical communication and it pays off it pays off to be to exploit that channel of communication in any form of life whatsoever. So we've gotten in uh, a couple more questions. Um, uh, I'll read um, a question from Susan. Thanks for your fantastic talk and your work more generally to challenge the humanistic hubris um, uh, in uh, among planned or really all question mark scientists. I'm reminded of uh, Vincien's Dupre's take on the important insight made possible in the shift to ethological versus laboratory research that it became- I, I'm sorry, I, 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 lost the, I lost the thread. Okay. Uh, I'm reminded of Vincien Dupre's take on the important insight made possible in the shift to ethological versus laboratory research right, that it right. became clear that learning how to address the creatures being studied is not a, not a result of scientific understanding, but rather the very condition of such understanding. Does it follow that plant science needs to move out of the lab too? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Well, it's all great questions, but I, I'm really especially concerned about this one because I, I, I you know, I'm as a philosopher of science, I, I, I teach my students, uh, you know, we are really concerned in the classroom about all these, all these biases that we are prey of, and one of them certainly has to do with the laboratory conditions. I mean, if you are trying to unearth a phenomena and try to understand it, well, maybe, maybe you need to rethink what is that you are doing. I mean. I, Think of the time lapse that you saw in the PowerPoint. We had just a stable static light from the top. I mean, just anything has nothing to do with it, with the variation of the spectrum from from the the sun rising to the sun setting, the trajectory it follows. The, I mean, it, it would be a joke to think that we are replicating anything related to the to real uh, ecological conditions. Now, with that being said, we need to understand that that those two approaches can be combined. So we need to remind ourselves that what we are doing in the lab is completely constrained to really impoverished lab, lab settings and conditions that allows us to have much more control that we could do in casual or natural observations uh, in the countryside, in the open, that's for sure. And we can learn different things from those two approaches. So in the wild, you will be able to make very interesting ecological observations, and then you will need to go to the lab and check how to control for those factors. But of course, you cannot simply translate what you observe in the wild to the lab or vice versa. You need to play on those two levels with complete different tools and reminding always to yourself that what you see here might not apply when you go out there. So to me, to me, I, I try I try to do both back and forth. So to be in the lab and go out there and you know, checking in and out completely. But think of Darwin. Darwin's observations were anything but controlled. And he was able to see astonishing phenomena. So it's, it's not that it's one or the other, it's that we should be combining both. Yeah, what a, what a great way to end. We're unfortunately out of time. We have a couple more questions. So I wanna just invite you since we have this great platform to seek out Paco and ask you questions and, and, and connect and stay in touch because I think that's the whole idea here. I wanna thank you again, Paco, for this inspiring talk um, and uh, all those wonderful answers. Thank you to um, everyone for asking such great questions. And then I hope to see you in one of the next panels. Sarah, is there anything else to say that I'm missing? Paco, when is your book coming out? Uh, it's coming out uh, spring 2022. Right. So, yeah, yeah, at last, at last, it's taking ages. <laughs> it's taking ages, but at last. <laughs> yeah, indefinite, I have to submit it once and for all in December. Then, then it will take until springtime to, to be out there in the, in the All in right, the we'll definitely yeah. look for it. Yeah, yeah, you can't imagine. I'm gonna be so happy to get rid of it. <laughs> 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 on to you, on to you. 
Thanks so much, Paco. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. And I think uh, the next panels are starting uh, is, is in an hour. Is that correct? No, no, they're almost right away. Right away. OK, yeah. see, that makes more sense. All yeah. right, perfect. They're the recorded sessions. OK, great. Okay. We'll see you there.